Miss Emma Hardinge The Wildfire Club Chapter 7 The Witch of Lowenthal Deep in the heart of the thick, umbrageous masses which constitute the black forest of Bohemia stands a deserted and crumbling pile of buildings once famous as the residence of the powerful Baron von Lohenthal. Birds of night and evil flitting things alone find shelter beneath the once stately roof. The broken door and moss-grown steps still give entrance to the noble hall, where fair dames and princes were wont to feast in all the boisterous revelry of a German baronial wassail. But the painted arches no longer re-echo the merry laugh and jovial song, and the springing step of the dancer will never again tread a measure on the fading mosaic of the silent banqueting room. The most perfect portion of the forsaken old pile is a beautiful little chapel situated in the rear of the building. Surrounded by a shady and peaceful cloister, where the golden sunbeams stream through the painted windows, lighting up the pure white marble of the monuments, within like uncertain tints of many-hued gems. Here the breeze faintly stirs, through rifts in the broken walls and tattered banners once prideful emblems of the prowess of the barons of Lowenthal. Here pompous elegies set forth the mighty achievements of their warriors, and the calm cold faces of marble saints look down in the deep mystery of their eternal silence on the vacant stalls where once the lowly worshipper sought to read in their immobile features his own destiny for weal or woe. The charm of the place and the only signs which redeem this score of ghostly legends and evil memories from the chilling influence of utter desolation are two exquisitely sculptured female figures as large as life, and occupying so prominent a position in the little sanctuary, as to show that they were chief features in the history of the surrounding scene. They represented two young and beautiful women, with faces no less dissimilar than their attitudes were striking. The one was evidently bound to a stake, and though the sculptor had simulated with wondrous skill the leaping flames already curling around her form, he had preserved in the upturned features of the victim an expression of passionate enthusiasm, so wondrously sublime that she seemed an embodiment of the spiritual triumphing over the keen agony of death in its most terrible shape. The second figure knelt beside the stake, her hair dishevelled, her garments rent, her straining eyes upturned, in frantic despair, and her hands wreathed above her head, till the swelling veins seemed ready to burst their marble prison, and testify to the Promethean fire of life, which the sculptor's art had drawn down from heaven to animate his superb monument. In these statues, the final destiny of the house had been typified. Its history was here ended, and the secret of its desolation revealed. The sculpture itself stood at the head of a large slab of pure white marble, which was simply inscribed to the memory of Clara, last Baroness of Lowenthal. From the various legends in currency respecting the fate of the subjects of these sculptures, we gather the following sketch. 
towards the close of the seventeenth century. A young Englishman of noble birth, but broken fortunes, who had been sent abroad in the hopes of improving a fascinating exterior and accomplishing manners into fortune by marriage with some wealthy heiress, happened to meet at a fashionable watering place with the Baron Franz von Lohenthal. The Baron was a widower, had a reputation of being immensely rich and blessed with an only daughter. The heiress, although living in strict seclusion, was said to be very beautiful. And as the Baron appeared to form a sudden and violent attachment to the young Englishman, it was in visions of a union with a paragon of beauty and wealth in perspective that the handsome adventurer yielded to the Baron's pressing solicitations that he would visit his castle of Lowenthal. Arrived there, all his wildest imaginings seemed realised. The castle was superb, the hunting superlative, the wine incomparable. But above all, the heiress more beautiful than the rising sun, and more mild, coy, yet loving than the tender beams of a summer moon. By heaven, she is mine already, ejaculated the bold fortune hunter, as on the third day of his residence at the castle. The compliant father began to joke him upon the sympathy apparently existing between the tastes and habits of the young couple, while the equally complacent daughter sighed, blushed, and said nothing. It certainly did not escape the observation of the Englishman that the whole proceeding seemed strongly to savour of the fact of his being brought here simply for the purpose of having a very young, lovely, and very wealthy bride almost thrust upon him. The young man had, as younger son of one of England's marquisites, a sounding title, but so had the young baroness. She retained that title too, and the empty English ladyship would add nothing to her rank. Even the grossest egotism could not attribute both father and daughter's marked predilection to their stranger guest simply to infatuation with his excellences. There must be a secret somewhere, and it was not without sundry misgivings, lest the said secret was or might prove to be the largest part of the strange destiny thus thrust upon him, that he tendered his hand, after three short weeks' acquaintance, and was both by father and daughter almost immediately accepted. In addition to the doubts, which this too ready compliance forced upon him, was one circumstance in connection with his beautiful betrothed, which greatly disconcerted him. From the very first moment of their acquaintance, he had never been able to converse with her alone. A young lady, whom the baroness called her foster-sister, was her constant companion, and despite of all the hints and innuendos of the bridegroom-elect, she never attempted for one moment to quit her post beside the lady. She was young, very beautiful, and as far as perfect silence and apparently perfect abstraction went, she never appeared to be a check on the lovers. Aware, however, that she was neither deaf nor absolutely blind, the Lord frequently felt as much provoked as perplexed at what he called her intrusive pertinacity. The wedding day at length arrived, however, and though the silent and phantom-like Gertrude was a necessary appendage to all the day's movements, the husband triumphantly reflected that the hour of this triune association must at length cease. Great, therefore, was his chagrin, and even indignation, when he found that even in the bridal chamber itself 
a veiled alcove had been set apart for the occupation of the inseparable companion. Remonstrances, prayers, and even threats were resorted to by the incensed bridegroom in vain. The young baroness declared with floods of tears that she had never been separated from her foster sister from her birth, and that her very life depended on her presence, and that if, in short, the trinity must be broken up, the separation must be between the married, not the single pair. Finding both bride and friend, and stranger still the father too inflexible, the puzzled lord had to endure his now hated companionship as best he could. The young baroness protested that from a child she had always been terrified of evil spirits. Many were known to linger round the castle. Strange sights and flitting forms had been seen within its halls and chambers. Low moans and dismal noises, too, were heard. The tables moved unbidden, doors shut and opened. And as witches were known to be abroad, and many trials in this very district had lately given victims to the flames, so the lady argued that Gertrude, by her superior sanctity and courage, had ever been her shield against this much-dreaded influence, and must continue still unless her lord desired to part with her or lose her life. Unsatisfactory as this explanation was, the young man soon began to find it had some foundation, at least to rest upon, for ere long his sleep was broken night after night by sounds most clearly superhuman in their origin. His room seemed to be filled by a whole legion of unseen wrappers. Windows, walls, and doors were broken with concussions from invisible agencies. Pattering feet were heard in every gallery, hall, and stairway, while flitting lights and ghostly shadowy forms stood like unquiet phantoms, as they were within his very chamber, crossed his path and seemed like guests familiar in the house sometimes more like its masters than himself. And now he found that day by day the domestics disappeared, and though fresh ones supplied their places, these never stayed above a week. All urging the house was fairly haunted, and not by one, but legions of evil spirits. The unfortunate Englishman now began to perceive some deeper meaning in his hasty union, than yet had met his darkest thought. The house was not only haunted, but possessed with a legion, that was clear. All the wild stories of midnight spectres and apparitions of terror, with which the age was teeming, seemed to gain dreadful credence in this awful mansion. After anxious search, and long consultation with his wife and father. He announced his unalterable intention of quitting the castle at once, insisting, with a husband's privilege, that his wife should accompany him. Instead of complying with the readiness of relief to avoid such a home of terror, he found he had to resort to the sternest authority before he could succeed in removing her from her phantom-ridden home. He soon found that the place was deserted by the neighbours on account of its evil reputation, and the utter loneliness consequent upon a reputation which he now discovered, for the first time, to be generally notorious was another cogent reason for his determination to abandon the castle. Great, however, was his consternation to learn that his new abode was subject to precisely the same torment as before. 
Groans and shrieks and cries of hideous cadence broke each midnight stillness. And though he moved from house to house, and town to town, go where he would, the wretched haunted man was still pursued by this dread spectral band. Worn out at last, and pondering whether life nor wealth was worth preserving at this dreadful price, although he loved his fair and gentle wife, he felt that he must die or quit her. Some mystery terrible was wrapped around her. She was the cause. It followed in her track, unless, and lo, the sunlight seemed to break upon his darkened mind. Good God, he cried, it is that fatal girl. She is a witch. These spectres, her companions, these sounds, their dreadful Sabbath rites performed within our hearing nightly. The wondrous influence, too, she had acquired over his wife, seemed now all fully accounted for. Without a word to any of the unhappy family with whom he had wedded, assured that both father and daughter were equally under the influence of the dreadful spell, he hastened oft to the nearest magistrate, and ere another sundown his case was told, listened to with the eager credulity of the horror-stricken agents of the law, and warrants instantly granted for the arrest of the accused. The Englishman, finding how readily his story was listened to, and how many similar cases the magistrates had lately been called upon to deal with by faggot and flame, rejoiced in the hope that once freed from the fascinating presence of the witch, the spell would be broken, and his wife, fast becoming now all precious to his heart, would soon be reconciled to her tormentor's fate. He proposed, therefore, to conduct the arrest with as much privacy as possible, but in this he reckoned without remembering his host was a witch. He found the unhappy ladies, by some inconceivable agency apprised of his whole proceedings, locked in each other's arms, and with the bitterest tokens of grief resolute in their purpose, that nothing but brutal violence should tear them asunder. On every other point than Gertrude's presence, the Lord had found his Clara gentle, complying, plastic as the wind. Now all was changed. Her rage and frantic exclamations of reproach broke through all bounds. And when at length she sobbed herself to silence upon her companion's breast, her wretched husband pleaded, they might be both removed, locked in each other's arms, into one cell, to save her very life. The exigency of the case, and the high rank of the sufferers, hastened the tardy movements of justice, and the accused was placed at the bar on trial for witchcraft, a few hours after her arrest. For the first time in his life, the Lord now looked on Gertrude without dislike, nay, with an admiration compelled by her tranquil air, her still and lofty courage, her statue-like composure, moveless dignity, her noble head and Grecian chiselled face, her lustrous eyes with that strange look of distance, which seemed to stray away to that far world from which she might well come. So spirit-like, unearthly, beautiful she looked. All these impressed their magic spell on every gazer's mind. Beside her stood, like some pale, broken flower, the wretched wife. Beneath her veil her dim eyes, red with weeping, looked out imploringly on every face, like a doomed captive, soliciting for pity, none who gazed on that wistful, woeful face. 
contrasted with the noble lofty calmness of her unmoved companion, but mistook the captive for the free. The baron himself stood near the pair, with downcast eyes and heaving breast like one borne down by sorrow. No defence was made, alas, t'was useless, as they stood in court, the thundering knockings and the wildering shrieks of unseen agents, seared every living soul with a deep brand of terror's scorching flame. The desk, the chairs, the benches, all seemed living. They reeled and rocked without a human hand to touch them, and the scene bore witness to the dreadful truth. The air was all alive with viewless things. The scared and livid witnesses shrunk off. The judge aghast and all the shivering court pronounced a hasty sentence. Death by flame, death, speedy death. The very earth was burdened whilst this most fearful sinner lived upon it. The sentence spoken, one wild shriek was heard. Two white arms tossed in air, the wretched Clara fell. Her husband bore her prostrate form away. One deep, low groan. The baron's heart seemed broken. The captive simply smiled and whispered low, Courage, my father, as I've lived, I'll die. That night the wretched lady spent beside her friend. The prison walls never echoed to sobs so heart-wrung as those which burst from Baroness Clara's lips. Overwhelmed at her grief, shocked, at an agony which was past his comprehension. The Lord drew his father-in-law aside, and whilst the unhappy daughter wept her heart away, he thus addressed him. May God forgive you, Baron, if you've wronged me. The misery my conduct seemed to have brought upon this family has all arisen, as yourself must see, from suffering me to thus become your son. T'was not in mortal power to live with this dread haunting, and what could urge you to seek for my alliance, and having formed it, to force this loathsome weird companionship on Clara and myself? I do in heaven's name bid you now disclose. Have then your wish replied the sorrowful baron, I sought a worthy husband for my child, and pitched on you because you were a stranger. None knowing would have married her. From infancy till now she's been the witch. Poor Gertrude has borne the name and shame. False, loath, deceiver, cried the Englishman, can this be true? "'As true as heaven,' replied the unhappy father. "'None would believe my tale. "'Tis one I cannot, dare not scarce believe myself. "'These sounds and sights from childhood have pursued her. "'From place to place I took her like one possessed. "'The dreadful secret I never dare disclose.' fearing the doom of witchcraft on the child, and yet I know her guiltless. What dreadful fate possesses her and me God only knows. This Gertrude was our pastor's only child. The story told to him, and known to her, induced the noble, generous girl, my Clara's earliest, truest friend, to live with her and dare the shame and blame should any question whence the terror came. My hope in marriage was that she might conquer, through your alliance, this evil haunting, or that you would protect her. Gertrude would first your wrath and anger bear, and so the timid, fearful child consented, that for a while 
she should appear the source whence all this shocking following seemed to come and now o god of heaven you know the fearful truth and my tender lamb must perish in the flames not so the wreathing husband hoarsely murmured she is your child whate'er her fearful crimes god's hand not ours is heavy on her now she is my wife beloved adored by me she must not shall not die i cannot lose her almighty father oh forgive the wrong the witch must live the innocent must die from far and wide from mountain forest glen town village hamlet thousands on thousands came to see the famous witch of lowenthal expiate her fearful crime by fire the sun that day glared like a huge red ball of angry fire the distant thunder boomed and flashing fire shivered the pine trees in the thick black woods hoarsely the sighing winds swept over the hill on which the witch's funeral pile was built in virgin white the noble victim came her head sublime with constant faith erect her foot was firm her sternly chiselled lips moved not nor parted till the white-robed priest with agonizing prayer held up the cross and bade her on its all-atoning emblem confess her crime and speed her soul to grace taking the cross with simple piety she whispered father forgive them they know not what they do on holy stephen's face there never shone a look more shining angel light more pure than on that dying martyr girl's white brow to heaven her full soul in her lustrous eyes looked out her brave and sinless life she freely gave to save the timid one whom she called friend whom more than all the world she knew to be the real cause of all in shame and mystery she'd lived to guard her in fire and agony she died to save her to save her no to meet with her in heaven ere high the ascending flames had wreathed her head like some old saint of old with halo of great light the wretched wife laid down her golden head upon her husband's strong supporting arm one look upon her friend her father heaven one moment given to sigh the name of gertrude the next her fluttering spirit opened the gate of that bright land of souls whereto her hand gave the first welcome to the enfranchised soul of her most wronged and yet most happy victim my gertrude my friend my martyred saint come home my sister clara art thou there before me the gates of light wide opened to admit them while spirit legions thronged to meet the victims of superstitious error ignorance and wrong They laid the noble baroness in state, Bewitched unto death, the story ran, Beneath the splendid marble which recalled her fate, And by her crumbling form, Two sorrowing men in secret, And at midnight's lone still hour, Placed a small crystal vase, Enclosed with pearls containing but a few black gathered ashes, one long black tress with one fair curl inwove and on the golden lid they carved out gertrude